All right, we ended on, uh, on Wednesday looking at the uh, structure of John's gospel. And uh, we, uh, we saw how after the prologue in 118 that uh, has given us a foundation that John's gospel is going to talk about the deity of Jesus Christ and how he became incarnate as he lived upon the earth and how there is a, a need for faith directed toward Jesus Christ that one might have a relationship with God, become a child of God, and how those who exercised faith when Christ was here upon the earth saw the glory of God revealed in Jesus Christ. And then we see in the body of the book the record of the signs that should lead to that belief in Jesus Christ. The belief that was manifested in those early disciples who saw the physical signs can now come about in the hearers of the Gospel of John as uh, they, they hear the record of the signs that signify and point to Jesus Christ. And we've seen how his public uh, ministry uh, began with a response of belief but then as he continued to do signs, there was growing hostility among the antagonists who were the religious leaders of, of Israel that even though they, they knew and said they adhered to the Old Testament, that in the end they rejected Jesus and, uh, and viewed him as a blasphemous man and sought to stop his... Uh, his ministry and the response of belief that was taking place among the multitudes. And so because of that, they, they humanly speaking, bring about the events that lead to the, the death of Jesus. We saw how this public ministry culminates with Jesus having, uh, having John having to speak about the fact, why did the Jews so hostily oppose him? Uh, particularly the members of the Sanhedrin who were the leaders of Israel. And he brings out that many did know and understand that truly from the Old Testament, that as you take a look at the signs that Jesus did and what Jesus said, this was clear evidence that he was the Messiah. But they didn't follow that understanding because they didn't want to lose their position within Judaism. That uh, they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. And that the, the Sanhedrin and even Israel as a people uh, did not respond because they could not respond because of judicial blindness that had been placed over them by God, uh, because they would not believe, that they could not believe. And though more evidence was given to them, it wasn't a response of belief, but of, of a greater and greater hostility and rejection that, uh, that comes about. And yet, there is still with the final words that uh, John records of Jesus to the, to the nation, individuals, as he cries out, can still respond in faith to Jesus. And that's very much like the audience of John's gospel. Right? You live among a people whose leadership has, has rejected Jesus as being the Messiah. But as I present these signs, you see they do it against the, against the very direct evidence of how Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament, and now you can respond in faith. And to those who respond in faith, we see the self-disclosure of Jesus through the cross and resurrection. And, and even here, this is part of an evangelistic thrust because Jesus continues to speak about the fact that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. Uh, probably one of the clearest statements in John chapter 14, uh, verse, uh, verse 9, 10, 11. See me, you've seen the Father. A clear statement of the deity of Christ following uh, 14, 6, that Jesus is the one and only way to the, the Father. But uh, as uh, we have seen, particularly within the uh, synoptics, particularly in the, in the journey of Jesus to Jerusalem, as recorded in Luke's gospel, where sit down and count the cost. There is a cost associated with 
following Jesus during this age that is hostile toward him. And so the self-disclosure of Jesus, where he communicates to his own that we're in the world, he continues to give further evidence of the fact that he is the Messiah, using again an image in chapter 15 of the fact that he is the vine, the true one, that uh, goes back to, uh, to Isaiah chapter 5 in response to the nation who was the unfaithful vine. Jesus is the true vine. And uh, uh, through faith in him and abiding in him, then, uh, uh, then one can truly know and serve God as, as he would. And so we have in, in the self-disclosure, we have uh, two things, two parts leading up to the purpose of the gospel, and that is in chapters 13 to 17, the communication of Jesus to his own in the world. He is leaving the world. They will remain in the world. And so we see that he loves them to the, to the very end, and, uh, and yet among his disciples himself is the ultimate hostile one, the ultimate rejecter, the one who will betray him, that is Judas. And it's only after Judas leaves that Jesus then goes into his discourse to prepare his disciples for his departure. And uh, he uh, basically says to his disciples, in fact, uh, five times he'll talk about the Holy Spirit coming as the paraclete, that uh, Jesus will leave, but now the presence of God will be among them through the Holy Spirit that uh, the Father and the Son will send to the disciples. And just as Jesus has given testimony to, to God... While he was here upon the earth, now the disciples will be the ones empowered by the Holy Spirit, united, abiding in Jesus, who then will give testimony to the, the world. And as chapter 16 brings up that in the same way they hated Jesus, uh, actually goes back into the end of chapter 15, 16, just they hated Jesus, they're going to hate the disciples, they're going to act toward the disciples as uh, they did uh, Jesus, uh, and, and yet uh, Jesus bequeathed to them peace within the world. And uh, so we, uh, we see in the, the discourse the, the preparation for these disciples as Jesus is going to be taken out of the world. And then we have the glorification, well, I'm sorry, it's chapter 17. Along with speaking with them, he also prays for them. He begins by praying for himself. And then in uh, chapter uh, 17, verses uh, 6 to 19, he prays uh, specifically for the disciples, for the 11. And again, the thrust of his prayer is they are being left in the world. And uh, so, Father, uh, protect them and, uh, and sanctify them by your word as they continue to live within the world. And then finally, in verses 20 to 24, he also prays for those who are going to believe through the disciples' word, that uh, they ultimately might uh, behold the glory of Jesus and be one with him as he is one with the Father. And of course, that, uh, that anticipates his, his uh, return uh, ultimately uh, to the earth uh, when that uh, will be fulfilled. But he is praying that for those who will uh, believe, and then he summarizes in verses uh, 25 and uh, 26 his, his prayer as he's departing again from the world. Uh, the world has not known them, the 11 and those who will believe through, but I have, I, I have known you and I have made <clears throat> you known to them and will make it known so that, uh, so that, Father, the love that exists between us will exist between them and us as well. And then we have the glorification of Jesus. We have in chapters 18 and 19 that uh, uh, Jesus is, is put to death. And even within that, as you get into chapter 19, even within his death, there is further fulfillment of Scripture. 
is uh, death also is in line with what was predicted within the Old Testament. And then that leads in chapter 20 to his uh, resurrection and the final resurrection appearance within the body of the Gospel of John where Thomas affirms by physically seeing the resurrected Jesus that Jesus was Lord and God. That's what, through, through hearing the Gospel of John, the hearer will come to recognize too about Jesus and uh, he, like Thomas, through this written testimony, should say concerning Jesus, my Lord and my God, to recognize him as, as uh, Messiah and God and having that belief and abiding in that belief, responding to that belief within his life, then uh, he, will, uh, he will have life eternal. And then we have an epilogue. All right, what about these disciples who believed? So by application also to the reader who now responds to the purpose of John and places his faith in Jesus Christ, we have the commission to the disciples from the resurrected Jesus. Uh, we have the third resurrection appearance given by John to the disciples. We have the restoration of Peter. This, this leads to the restoration of Peter and uh, the record that Peter, along with all of the disciples, include the beloved disciple, are to, to, are to follow Jesus and give testimony to him. The beloved disciple has done that within this book. And then in 2125, he even says, there's many other things that I could have written, but these are written, um, as he has said in verse 24, uh, uh, truly, but there's many other things which they are written in detail that if the, the world itself could not contain the books which were written. Uh, Jesus is, is greater than even what I have been able to write within this book. Uh, there's many, many, many more books that could be written about the greatness of Jesus. Now you can uh, see providentially within the canon why John comes with the last of the, the Gospels, okay? From all that you've read, there's even more that could have been written, even about Jesus' time here upon the earth. But, uh, but this is enough. This is enough to lead you to faith and to following Jesus Christ. And so John's gospel comes to an end. Now, when we talk about resources on the gospel of John, we have some very, very good resources that are available on uh, John's gospel, particularly the two outstanding works by, by D.A. Carson and Leon Morris. Now, if forced to say you got to have one or the other, I would recommend Carson. Uh, Carson uh, deals well with uh, historical background, with... Uh, with the structure of the, uh, the gospel of uh, John and even gives you some hints on how to preach it. Um, and uh, I know that uh, as Dr. MacArthur is thinking about bringing his uh, New Testament set to, uh, uh, to conclusion, he's thinking in the gospel of John not of writing as broad a, a work as he has, a detailed work as he's had in Matthew and will develop on Luke and hopefully on Mark, but as even talked about the fact that he might just write more of a, a summary of John for expositors and look up the details in, uh, in D.A. Carson. So since Dr. MacArthur said that, I would also recommend that if he does that, obviously you'll need a copy of Carson to look up the details. And it is. It's about an 800-page uh, commentary on John and uh, should be the first, your first buy on the gospel. Uh, Morris is close to 1,000 pages. And uh, uh, Morris, even more than, than, uh, than Carson, not only explains but seeks to interact more apologetically with the more liberal approaches on, on John's gospel and, uh, and has sought to defend the, uh, the historicity of John's gospel in the face of uh, liberal attack upon it. So... Uh, and he spends more time doing that than Carson. 
um, and yet also uh, you know exposits uh, the book, uh, gives its uh, explanation in in a good uh, a good fashion as well. And and really in the end, when someone says, "Well, which two should I get?" my answer is usually yes. Get them both. Uh, they're both well worth uh, having and uh, interacting with, and and uh, certainly should be the foundation volumes you have on the Gospel of John. There are two. Uh, there are two exegetical works, both from a liberal stance. Um, I put the work down by C.K. Barrett. Barrett does a little bit more with the theology of the book. And even though he is skeptical, remember he says, if you read it from John's vantage point, you've got to believe in the, the deity of Jesus. And he does seek uh, within his exegesis to read it from John's vantage point, although at times he will tell you John is wrong because he is a skeptic. But, uh, but by and large, it is a, a, a good work. It is a little less expensive than the two-volume work that is recommended by, the, uh, uh, by Dr. Thomas in the Greek department uh, by uh, Raymond Brown. Uh, his uh, volume, uh, two volumes on John in the Anchor Bible commentary series. Uh, and, and in the end, exegetically, if uh, almost like uh, Carson and Morris balance each other out, the same thing is true with Barrett and Brown. Someday I should probably add that, but I think in terms of your wallet of seminary students, you can only buy so much. But, uh, uh, but Barrett and Brown are the two uh, exegetical standards on, on the gospel. And then expositionally, um, uh, before, until Dr. MacArthur uh, comes out, you'll have to uh, appreciate the work by Bruce uh, Milner, a uh, pastor up in the Vancouver area, whose exposition is very much based upon Carson and Morris. He's already done what Dr. You know, MacArthur has said. All right, take these two volumes and put together some sermons. And uh, the Bible speaks today as his sermons that he gave to his church on the, uh, the gospel of uh, John. But you'll find a lot of reflection, as I said, of Morris and Carson within his works. And then you want just a little different tact. The work by Gary Berg in the NAVAC. Um, insightful... Um, interpretation, and uh, even does a very good job of thinking through the principles that emerge. But, uh, but Berg, when it comes to contemporary application, he is, uh, he is an evangelical, traditional Presbyterian with charismatic leanings. And uh, so at times, uh, uh, his application would not be quite where I would go because I am, first of all, not highly liturgical Presbyterian, and I am certainly not uh, charismatic. But when he deals with the, the deity of Jesus and its importance in a pluralistic age in which we live, he's right on. I mean, he's certainly evangelical at, at that point. Uh, so, so read Berg with a little bit of discernment. But I know I've talked uh, in my uh, uh, preaching uh, ministry in some of our alumni churches in uh, the last couple of years. Um, some of our men, and I, th I think rightfully so, are finding some help as they're putting their meshes together within Berg along with these other uh, with these other books and TMS grads do read all works with great discernment so you will too uh, so do so with discernment and you'll find some, some help too uh, with, uh, with Berg uh, I'll just leave it at that uh, enough said alright he's right on in, he speaks about the uniqueness of Jesus being the son of God being the only begotten of God, uh, and how we have to stand for that in a pluralistic world. So he's very exclusivistic when it comes to salvation, very uh, exclusivistic on the fact that we have got to maintain the uniqueness of Jesus. We cannot give that up 
and uh, how in our preaching we've got to make that, that issue very, very clear to our people because of the world in which they're living, where all truth is, you know, from God and you pick and choose whatever you want religiously. So on that point, he is, uh, you know, he is, and I, I think, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be, because of his background, uh, well, he's from Wheaton, so let's, let's start there. He's, he's a Wheaton prof. Uh, so obviously, he is very much attuned to broad evangelical thinking because it's very much a part of the, the Wheaton campus, and we'll expose you to that. Uh, you know, we really are very much more sheltered. He's coming into contact with, uh, you know, with evangelicals or to- toying around with, uh, with evangelical thinking. He obviously, he's in the midst uh, at that point uh, in the greater uh, Chicago area where, where uh, the openness of God movement is much stronger than here in Southern California. So he's very much aware of what is taking place uh, there. He also obviously is involved in uh, the United Presbyterian Church, a mainline denomination. He's very much aware of the literature in that area. As I said, he also gives credence to you know, charismatic phenomena, so he's obviously into that literature. And, and can kind of provoke you with, this is what is being said in these different areas, trying to counteract the exclusivity and deity of Jesus Christ. And uh, so I think he makes you aware of currents that are really at work and influencing people within your church that uh, you don't always, uh, and you shouldn't, you know, spend your time necessarily reading and interacting with. But he has, and I, I think at that level, does a good job of saying, no, if John is the word of God, and it is, We have to take a firm stand in the midst of all of these currents for the deity of Christ and the exclusivity of Christ as being the only way to God, the only means of salvation. Now, that way, I think we can all affirm what he is uh, is saying. So, um, um, so read with the sermon. Uh, I think he is a brother in Christ, although... In some places, I would not go along necessarily with his interpretation. Definitely a point, not with his uh, contemporary application. I don't think we are called to reduplicate the, uh, the works of Christ miraculously today. I don't have those charismatic leanings, obviously. And uh, I certainly would say that uh, renewed worship is probably in a little different sphere than he would see it with his United Presbyterian uh, uh, background. Do you recommend that commentary on John? I've used it here and there. Um, I, I think uh, Bruce is definitely superseded uh, by uh, Morris and Carson. For your study as, as preachers, if you were to do a class uh, on, uh, on John, Bruce might be a, a simpler text. I like Tenney's text on John, Gospel of Belief. I also... Uh, I uh, think that uh, for a lay audience, Homer Kent's text on uh, on uh, John is also you know very valuable as well. But uh, but I'm trying to help you you know have resources that I think are the best for your expository ministry. So uh, and, and and do be aware. And I I'm glad you brought that question up, Steve, on on Bruce and some of these other commentaries. Uh, because a number of uh, weeks ago, I was stopped by one of our graduates who's getting ready to, uh, to teach in, in a uh, lay uh, atmosphere a, uh, a book. I'll let it go at that. And he says, I went back on your notes, and I realized what I should be studying as the teacher. And I appreciate that. I've got them into him. I think your recommendations are good. But I've got to choose a text for the lay people. And you don't, you know, if there's a weakness, you don't do that. You don't say, now, if you were to teach this to lay people, you know, where is a good foundational text? So who knows? Maybe in the future, that's the, that's, that's the, fourth, the fourth one, you know. Okay, if you're going to teach it in a lay environment, you know, what would be a good text? And, 
And uh, so we discussed it, and uh, and he came back to me and said, I've chosen, you know, the text that you recommended going through it. I mean, it's, it's exactly what I'm looking for. So uh, maybe I do need to, you know, branch this out. But remember, I'm giving you these recommendations because you're going to be biblical expositors. You will be the teachers. So that um, uh, so that even though there are some other valuable works out there, I'm trying to help you get the works that will be most valuable for you for what God has called you to do in your ministry. All right, two interpretive issues. Um, and we really don't have uh, time, sorry to say, to spend a whole lot of time discussing these issues. And uh, in the end, uh, Dr. MacArthur in both, uh, in both cases holds the right position. So... <laughs> I guess Dr. MacArthur would say, in the end, you hold the right position. Um, so as far as conclusion is concerned, it's what's in the, uh, the study Bible. But uh, in my, uh, my teaching of John's gospel, I found that uh, with many other interpretive issues, these, these are the two that among lay people are certainly discussed and they want to know what your answer is. Uh, John chapter 3, verse 5. Truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. All right, now, how are we to, uh, to understand water within this, this context? Jesus is talking to, uh, to Nicodemus. And, uh, and notice in verse 3, he says, you... You must uh, be born again unless one is born again, born from above. He cannot see the kingdom of God. We know you're a teacher coming from God. All right. The implied question, how does one enter into the, uh, the kingdom? Jesus says it comes through new birth. That uh, the person now needs to be born from above so that uh, he might enter the kingdom when it is established. He further defines that because Nicodemus asked him, how can a man be born when he is old? How can this take place? And so Jesus in, in verse 5 is explaining how this birth from above occurs unless one is born of water and spirit. Now it's not just a matter of seeing he cannot uh, enter the kingdom of God. So the new birth is necessary to, to see it, to experiencing it, and you've got to be born from above in this way to uh, enter into the, uh, the kingdom. Now there's no problem really with spirit. There's... Only a few renegades who would see this as wind at this point. You know, water and wind being analogous of something greater. Uh, Moses would take within this context, because he uh, goes on and says, verse 8, so is everyone who's born of the Spirit. And this is the Holy Spirit. So what is the water? Everyone agrees that Spirit is part of the, the process. What is water? And the fact that there is a very close connection between them, born of water and the Spirit. And how do we take the chi at that point, the end? Well, some would see water as, as a different element here. There's two elements, water and Spirit. And some make it very easy based upon verse 8, born of the Spirit. The water is just an interpolation here. It wasn't the part of the original text. An interpolation is the fact we have no textual evidence. It can't be a, a textual variant because there is no variant within our texts. So what is the, uh, what is, well, interpolation wasn't there when John wrote it. Well, how do you know that? Well, because it doesn't fit what John would have said. Because in verse 8, he says, born just of the Spirit. So water was added later. Well, we can't take that kind of a cavalier approach to the text. You know, the 
all of the texts have water and spirit. And uh, so what is it? Well, water was, uh, was viewed based upon Old Testament usage, like in Proverbs chapter 5, by certain of the rabbis, to stand for the semen, that which is the source of physical birth. And what Jesus is saying at this point is, is that uh, you've got to have spiritual seed along with the spirit. Some would take that water is reflecting here physical birth. One is born in water the first time. And then the second birth is by means of the Spirit. If you want to follow John Calvin, you will see water as being itself also symbolic of the spirits. And in fact, uh, my... Greek professor took uh, the chi there as uh, not copulative, but uh, here being even, water, even the spirit. Because as you go through the Gospel of John, where water is used as, as an image, many times it is an image of the spirit. And uh, so this is, this is the, the water, even the spirit. And so verse 8, Everyone who's born of the Spirit. So this is the Holy Spirit. Can't take position. It's the Word of God. It is the water of the Word that uh, Paul states within his writings is the cleansing agents. So it is cleansed by means of the Word, responded by faith. And one who responds to the Word in faith then also receives and then dwelt by the Holy Spirit. It's the word of God. Barrett and Berg thinks this probably has the best imagery within this, this context is that the water is the baptism of John. That one has to accept John's baptism unto repentance and then through Jesus he will receive the baptism of the Spirit. So the water here is representative of John's baptism. Barrett says, and this is the one you should just negate along with A right away, Christian baptism. I don't think Nicodemus had a clue about, you know, after the death and resurrection of Jesus, you need to be baptized in water to show your faith in Christ and also receive the Spirit. The best position is to see Jesus because later on in verse 10, he says to Nicodemus, chides him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Chides him with what I am talking to you about is in the Old Testaments. And that the particular passage that he looks at in the Old Testament is the passage in Ezekiel 36 that talks about those who will enter the land, those who will, those who will experience the kingdom in the future are those whom God will do what? Cleanse with water and place his spirit within them. So that how can this birth from above take place? Nicodemus, if you read carefully the Old Testament, you would know how. One is born of water and the Spirit to enter the kingdom of God. If it's flesh, you will remain in the flesh. He has to be born of the Spirit, therefore you all must be born again. It's not just you, Nicodemus. All must be born again. And uh, this, this... This new birth is like the wind. It comes from God and cannot be explained, just like where the wind comes from and where it goes is uh, beyond human explanation. And so water. And I would say, gee, is, is a... Is a the purification or cleansing element, it is a distinct element, 
on the basis of Ezekiel 36. If not, then I would go along with D, that it, uh, it, it is a, another representation within this passage of the, uh, of the Holy Spirit. But, uh, but I would go along with Carson and uh, MacArthur. And I told you Milna is very reflective of Carson and uh, uh, Morris at this place, Carson, in taking the same position. All right, a second, uh, uh, second interpretive issue is the one in John chapter 20. John chapter uh, 20, the, uh, the command of Jesus to the 11 to receive the Holy Spirit. This is the first day of the week. This is the evening of uh, the resurrection in our calendar. The evening on that day, the first day of the week. Jesus comes, stands in the midst of the ten, saying, Peace be with you. And he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples therefore rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus therefore said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. So the context is within the commission that the disciples now will go forth to represent Jesus Christ in the same way that Jesus Christ represented the Father while here upon the earth. He is talking about what he gave within the farewell discourse. Now you're going to become my representatives. And as my representatives, what you need is you need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. You need the paraclete that is going to be sent. And so in verse 22, he breathed. And literally it just means he breathed out. It doesn't say on the text he breathed on them. He just exhaled. He breathed and says, receive the Spirit. If you forgive the sins that have been forgiven, retain, they have been retained. This now is an outworking of the ministry that they are going to have. Four positions here. The first position is, well, this is just a myth. Never happened. Just making the theological point. This is a theological myth, and liberals will talk to it about this being the Johannine Pentecost. Uh, whether the day of Pentecost have actually happened historically, we don't know. It's just the early church believed that somehow the disciples got the Holy Spirit. This is just John's way of saying how they got the Holy Spirit, as opposed to Acts Luke's way to telling us how they got the Holy Spirit. Which one is right? Which one is wrong? Well, to liberals, neither one. Some would say, well, at this point, there is a full bestowal of the Holy Spirit. Then what is the book of Acts? Well, it's the full bestowal of the Holy Spirit, but it's, doesn't, it doesn't replace, it doesn't repeat what takes place here. They have all the spirit they're going to get here on this, uh, this evening of Resurrection Sunday in our calendar. Well, my problem with that is if they got the full bestowal of the Holy Spirit here, what is Acts chapter 2? Which, according to Acts 1, is remain in Jerusalem until you receive that which... I promised you. I mean, you will, you will uh, uh, receive the Spirit and, uh, you know, become my witness. The Spirit will come upon you and be my witnesses, etc. How can you say there's a full bestowal here if there's a future bestowal in Acts 1 and Acts 2 after chronologically this time? Within evangelicalism, the most popular viewpoint traditionally has been that this is a temporary bestowal of the Spirit. All right? Jesus is coming and going. And while he's gone, they need the Spirit. And then he's going to be gone from, you know, 40 days. He's going to go up into heaven and they have to wait till the 50th day to get the Holy Spirit. They basically need a temporary bestowal. They need, the, they, they need at least a part of the bestowal of the Spirit to get them through until they get the full bestowal of the Spirit. And 
the men who take this position are, are legion. But, and good men. Uh, you know, Tenney, Walver, et cetera, da, 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 da. Calvin, Godet. I mean, you, you got the good men who take this position. But of course, the problem is they saw this, this text, and, and what do you say? They got a temporary bestowal, and somehow was that taken away before they got the full bestowal? I mean, how do you explain a temporary? It's kind of like, uh, well, you don't get the full right now, but I'll give you at least enough to get you through until you do. But that's not the context of uh, John chapter 20. Now, it is true, it is the present imperative, repeat, receive the Spirit. But we need to realize that in John's gospel at time, the present imperative can speak about something that takes place in the future. Go back to John chapter 7. Verse 37, if any man is thirsty... Let him come to me and drink. Present the parents. Now, come now and drink now. But uh, notice verse 39. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. Not only this, not only do we have a present imperative, something receive which seems to be implied now with John making it clear, it's not then, it was something in the future, but he's talking about the same reality. Come and drink to receive the Spirit, which you don't receive now, you'll receive in the future. This he spoke of the Spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. And within the context of the Gospel of John, glorification is not completed. John 17, 1 to 5, until the Son returns to the Father and is glorified with the glory that he had with the Father before the world was created. And so John 7 really helps us to appreciate there was at this point no way for the disciples to receive the Spirit because Jesus was not yet glorified. And so just as John 7, he's using the present imperative to say, all right, receive the Spirit, but the experience of the, receiving the Spirit is going to take place when? In the future, on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit is poured out. And that's tied in with receive the Spirit and there's no breathing out on them at this point. He's just, he's just exhaling, I think, again, as an indication that when the Spirit is given that they will receive, it's going to come from Jesus, just like the breath in that point comes from Jesus. And within the context, why I read, I'm sending you, right? And sending you, you to be my spokesman, and uh, both, both uh, John 15, 16, along with Acts chapter 1, 2, make it very, very clear it is the endowment with the Holy Spirit that then allows them to be the representatives of Jesus that he has called them to be. And so receive the Spirit, even though it is a present imperative, is an anticipation of the future bestowal of the Holy Spirit, i.e., on the day of Pentecost. And then, when the Holy Spirit is received, they will fulfill their their apostolic commission as given in verse 23. And that is uh, uh, the way I would, uh, 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 I would say within the Joinhein and canonical thinking that uh, we are to understand and receive the Spirit's anticipation of the future bestowal of the Holy Spirit. Preaching John. Well, I've already made statements about that. Uh, statements... Uh, that John is given to bring belief in non-believers, particularly non-believers, well acquainted with the Old Testament. I would basically say, you know, John is an evangelistic uh, uh, book for those who have uh, a biblical 
uh, understanding. Uh, Mark is more the evangelistic gospel for those who don't have that, have more of a pagan background. And of course, we're moving more away in our culture from John to Mark because more and more people have a purely uh, uh, non-Christian background. Whereas a generation or two ago, most everyone in the United States had some knowledge of, of biblical Christianity, uh, some understanding of uh, what was in the, uh, the Old Testament, uh, that uh, all, even outside the church, uh, even within our public school system, had to learn basic truths from the Old Testament because we were a Judaic uh, Christian culture. Obviously, it was moved away from that. We have less people who can pick up the gospel of John within our culture and, uh, and understand it as opposed to Mark. But, uh, but certainly those who do have an appreciation of the, uh, the Old Testament uh, certainly can uh, read through John and recognize that the signs make it very, very clear and through what Jesus said that he is the fulfillment of what was said in the Old Testament. And allow the word by the Spirit of God to bring them to faith in, the, in Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, and so bring them to eternal life. But uh, I think it is vital in this day and age in which we live, and I would go along with uh, Berg on this, in a pluralistic society like today, we need to have believers evangelizing who are convinced of the deity and exclusivity of Jesus for salvation in the pluralistic world in which we live. And that certainly is a result of, of exposition of the gospel of John. That uh, preach it within your church because the evangelists will gain an appreciation of who Jesus was and the exclusivity of of the gospel message in him. You'll, if I can put it this way, you'll, you'll have God raise up good evangelists in your church if you expose them to the gospel of John. And then as in that day, they will be the ones who will take the gospel of John to, to the world. And even if they're going to take Mark, it certainly is good to, to have John so that they are fully committed and understanding of uh, the person of Jesus. So, uh, so preach it, and, and, and I would preach it fairly early within your ministry. If you don't do Mark, I would do John. I, the other way, to the end of uh, my ministry. Um, but, uh, but nevertheless, it is, it is in, and you see that, that uh, God does in his providence bring Bring people in to hear who are non-Christians. I saw that happen as I preached the Gospel of John, but but also seeing how how well it equipped people within the uh, the church for their evangelistic ministry. So, um, if, if you want to create a spark of evangelism within your church, uh, John or Mark uh, should be uh, early within your your preaching ministry. And by the way, that's the reason I've got three graduates that I know of right now that sat where you were sitting two, three years ago who are preaching John's gospel. I was going to say even as we speak, but not quite. They're preaching it this weekend. But, uh, and and uh, men that I, as I have, uh, you know, been with them have said what you said John would do is happening within my church. I'm seeing a stability in Christology, theologically. I'm seeing a renewed fervor evangelistically through the responses taking place in the church to uh, the preaching of the gospel of John. So, so those are three men that literally left where you left, and the very first thing they did as they got to the church on Sunday morning was uh, preaching John. And by the way, you're in good stead at that point because the first gospel preached by our president at Grace Community Church was the gospel of John. So go and do likewise. All right. Now I put that up, but we've got to get to the, uh, the notes first on uh, moving into uh, uh, to a study of the life of Christ. And uh, 
we're just uh, going to overview this uh, very, very quickly. Um, let me first of all make a, a quick word, give you a quick word about some of the resources available here. Uh, next to, uh, to your Bible, and you'll see I've got the first edition, the original, you know, Moody Press, uh, Harmony of the Gospels, when it first came out in 1978. Uh, some of you now have, it's just come from Moody, I think, to, uh, to Zonovan, to Harper, and you've got that edition now. Uh, some of you might even have the edition that has uh, both the New American Standard and NIV together. You can sometimes pick those up as cheap as the New American Standard uh, by itself. But the New American Standard is the one I want you to, uh, to read. The same footnotes have just been adapted to the, to the NIV. That's Zondervan's got the copyright to that, so you can realize why. They put it uh, together with the, uh, with the NIV. And Dr. Thomas, Dr. Gundry, thanks to, to their influence, have uh, maintained a continuing um, tradition of the original New American Standard you know, being, uh, being used uh, for this, this harmony. And I would say next to, uh, next to my Greek and Hebrew texts and uh, English versions, the book that I have used most in my pastoral ministry, because this came out basically when I was starting my pastoral ministry, has been Thomas and Gundry. Uh, this will be a, a very close uh, friend of yours as you uh, study the Gospels. And I do this because, um, because of, again, my own uh, response to pastoral ministry. Uh, fortunately, while I was in seminary, I took uh, the, the course by Dr. Pentecost that today you, you can read the course I took in the words and uh, the works, the words and works of Jesus Christ. And uh, literally, this is the course that I took in seminary from Dr. Pentecost. And I was so appreciative of that once I got into pastoral ministry because I'll put it to this, this way to you, uh, gentlemen, that when you become an expositor, when you become a pastor, people expect that you know exactly where everything took place in the life of Christ. They'll not only expect you to be knowledgeable in Scripture, but they will expect you to be an expert in the life of Christ. And I realize we help with that as an elective too. You don't take the elective. You could leave seminary and never think through, well, how does the life of Christ fit together? So that's the reason why I just take a week and say, all right, get familiar with the harmony. Uh, because you're going to have to, you're going to use this not only in your teaching and preaching, but there's going to be times when people are asking you, you know, did that happen in his last year of ministry or was that in his first year of ministry? And gentlemen, you can't at that point say, that's a good question. I've never thought about that. Um, so I want to come after the Gospels and say, all right, how do they fit together? And this is not an extensive course that's available in an elective, but at least hit some of the high points of what you need to know as far as the chronology and harmony of the life of Christ. Now, the classic work in this area, and I'm amazed at how many people have this. I'm even more amazed at how many lay people have read this. Alfred Eidesheim's Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. And the reason why is because it basically became public domain about 50, 60 years ago. And, you know, you can, uh, you can till this day, pick up copies of this basically for the price of printing. It's a very reasonable book. And in its own way, a very excellent book. And this was the very first book I read on the life and ministry of Jesus. Well, because it was the cheapest and the one everybody else was reading when I was in college. Now, there has been some debate about Eidesheim. Eidesheim was a converted Jew, Jewish believer in Jesus Christ in Europe in the 19th century, who, from his Jewish background, was well aware of, of the Mishnah as a, 
an amalgamation, as we have seen, as far as Judaism is concerned, of rabbinic teaching, teaching that was believed was taking place during Second Temple Judaism when Jesus Christ was here upon the earth. It is true that Eidesheim uses this material within the Mishnah and then broadened out within the, uh, the Talmud. He uses the Mishnah and Talmud to basically say, well, what is there within the Mishnaic literature helps us to appreciate the times of Jesus the Messiah. So that uh, his, his background is not fully informed by other materials as, uh, as we do today. Obviously, he wrote before the archaeological revolution. He really didn't use that much of uh, Josephus and, uh, and Philo. He really concentrated upon from the rabbis what was the understanding of, uh, of Jewish thought at the time of Jesus and reads the Gospels against that backdrop. Because of that, some have, and, and Eidesheim among contemporary evangelical and non-evangelical scholars is basically relegated because of that, of, of what they would say unbalanced as far as backgrounds are concerned. But again, I will tell you practically that uh, the average layperson has not heard what the scholars had to say because fortunately they don't read them, at least the liberal ones. They have continued to buy Eidesheim and read it. And we should be, in one sense, thankful they do uh, because Eidesheim does give them an appreciation for what is in the Gospels and teaches them to truly understand it, you need to understand contemporary Jewish thinking. This is what is what was the uh, milieu of Jesus while he was here upon the earth. And I would rather have them read it and then say, all right, we can question whether on certain points the background is completely accurate. But uh, to realize that uh, these people have, have moved in their understanding thanks to, to Eidesheim's work. Now, certainly Eidesheim's work is read by, if I put it this way, the more reading-type personnel within your congregation. I'm not going to say that you're going to go to a congregation, everybody's read Eidesheim, because the majority of your congregation doesn't read anything. All right, we, we're in a non-literate age as far as people reading. But the readers within your congregation, you know, many times will have read Eidesheim. Of my, oh dozen or so elders that I had while I was in Redondo Beach, not all at one time, but the men who served with me, probably four or five of them had read Eidesheim. Yeah, because they're, they're reading kind of men, and as reading kind of men, this was one of the things that, uh, that they had read. So be aware of that. And I would even say, make it a part of your library. Uh, if, if your congregation is reading it, you read it. And then some newer works, obviously Pentecost work, and uh, the work uh, by Van Gruggen, Christ on Earth. And uh, these are the two uh, books uh, along with the, the harmony that uh, Dr. Thomas would require if you took the Life of Christ class. And they are valuable. They are certainly not as extensive as Eidesheim, but uh, they, uh, they, they certainly hit the, the high points and go through passage by passage and seek to be a commentary upon a harmony. Uh, now, Van Bruggen doesn't, this is not the harmony. Uh, Pentecost basis is on Robertson's harmony and uh, Van Bruggen on, I think, Allen's work uh, from the continent. But they're close enough that basically they are paragraph by paragraph commentaries on what you have within the harmony. Now, a work that has also been very popular by, uh, by he F. Harrison, A Short Life of Christ, is not a paragraph-by-paragraph paragraph commentary on a harmony. What it is, is let's look at, all right, the birth of Christ, the infancy of Christ, the baptism of Christ, the temptation of Christ, the teaching of Christ. What, what it does is basically deal with the broader topics which emerge 
uh, from the study of the, the life of Christ and then tries to give you a topic-by-topic -topic approach. And uh, that's why it's called a short life of Christ. It's no longer in print, but then Donald Guthrie brought out a book that was called A Shorter Life of Christ. I thought that was... Uh, but uh, Harrison is still in, uh, in print. Actually, Guthrie's work, uh, even being more abbreviated uh, than even Harrison's, but if you can get a copy of it, it actually... And actually, it is his article in, uh, in the Zondervan uh, Pictorial Bible Encyclopedia, so you don't need to go find it if you got the encyclopedia. That's, that's there. But Zondervan published it as the shorter life of, of Christ. Now, as you... As you go through the life of Christ, and this is where we're going to have to, to end and then really start uh, and complete looking at it uh, next time. But as you go through the, the, the life of Christ, and again, you'll be amazed at how much these issues come up even with a lay congregation today. But you deal with issues of chronology. Right? A Bible atlas helps you appreciate where things took place. And there's not as much dispute. You can take a look at the maps in the back of your Bibles, and by and large, they're very accurate to where things took place in the life of Christ. And certainly you want to have and help people to appreciate the, uh, the where as well as the what. But also then questions come up on the when, when did these events take place? And at that point, you get into issues of chronology. And uh, uh, there are two more books beyond the harmony that you should be familiar with when it comes to issues of chronology. Uh, the first is the work by Harold Honer, that has gone through different colorization on the, uh, on the cover, so it can look differently now. But uh, his work on the chronological aspects of the life of Christ, where he goes through and interacts quite extensively with uh, when was Christ born? When did he begin his ministry? How long was his ministry? And particularly when it comes to the duration of Christ. Uh, life and the day in which he was crucified. Uh, those are issues that are very much discussed among uh, lay people within within the church. If they've if they've done some reading in the New Testament, they they are concerned about well, how long exactly was the ministry, and what was the day of crucifixion, and the fact that there's popular argumentation out of there, and now thanks to the web, everyone can be an expert very quickly on these areas, and depending on what website they've gone to, they may or may not be speaking what we would believe is the truth within these chronological areas. Well, we're coming on that. Okay, get a copy of Hona's book. It has been very, very influential in evangelical circles. Not so influential, but uh, certainly to help you understand the whole area of chronology, both Old and New Testament, and uh, with some very interesting data in this area, too, is the work by Jack Finnegan on the Handbook of Bible Chronology. And uh, these works, along with the, the harmony, is what I will uh, base our discussion on when it comes to the uh, to the discussion of when Christ was born, when Christ began his ministry, how long his ministry was, on what day he died uh, as far as his crucifixion is concerned. Uh, we'll take some excursions and deal with those issues along with overviewing from beginning to end, step by step, the life of Christ, at least in a broad sequence, and bring the Gospels together.